today we're going to talk about the validity of prayer. Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Today we're going to talk about um, the, the third topic in the series on prayer uh, that had been requested. The first was what is prayer, and the second is distractions during prayer. Today we're going to talk about the validity of prayer. And the validity of prayer is, of course, closely related to what prayer is. But um, we're going to be talking sort of in uh, drawing out practical applications. But the the um, the TLDW is, uh, well, you know, love and do as you will, as St. Augustine put it. But that's love in the sense of agape, the generous love of God, willing the good of the other for his sake. So it kind of bundles a lot up into it. It's not a mere affection or desire or something like that, but rather the willing of the good of the other for their sake. Uh, so to unpack that, though, um, there are different kinds of prayer. So uh, we'll sort of address this by kind of prayer. So um, uh, one kind of prayer, for example, is prayer of praise. So uh, this is really simple. Anything that you say about God that's true is a valid prayer of praise. You know, oh Lord, you are, you are great and wise and merciful and just and, and powerful and um, so on. Yep, all true, all valid prayer of praise. Um, praise for any particular action. You know, oh Lord, uh, you know, you gave to us the, the wondrous you know, mountains. Oh Lord, you gave to us the wonders of vanilla ice cream. All of these, again, are entirely valid because they're all true. They're talking about good things about God and they're true. So, hey, that is praise. That is valid praise. Um, there's some details. If you're doing this communally, you want to make sure that everybody else, you, you want to pick things that everybody else will understand as you seriously praising God for the, you know, for his goodness and the goodness um, that he has given to creation. But, um, uh, aside from, you know, so, so like, you know, praising God for vanilla ice cream, you want to be a little bit careful about just making sure you know the people around you. But, you know, if you know that everybody is going to take this correctly, perfectly valid. And, and I mean, it would be perfectly valid anyway, but you don't want to tempt other people. Um, so, you know, but like if you're on your own, have at it. Anything good, fair game. Relatedly. Prayers of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for your gifts, such as vanilla ice cream. Thank you, Lord, for your gift of giving us existence. Thank you, Lord, for your gift of gravity and air and uh, the, you know, electro electroweak forces, um, electromagnetic, you know, forces and, you know, for light and so on. All entirely valid. Anything that is good, you can thank God for because the only reason anything exists is God. And so anything good comes from God. Now, often through secondary causation, uh, because God likes secondary causation. That's a technical term. I like actually to call it delegation. Um, so, you know, uh, instead of just giving you food directly, God will give it to somebody else to give you food. So, um, you know, often the good that you receive is from God through somebody incorporating them into God's act of love. So, um, you know, but, but that, in no way diminishes it coming from God. That just means that God has incorporated other people into his love. And so they have, they are part of God's love to you. So in thanking God for these things, you are also thanking God for that person that he incorporated. Um, but you know, it never hurts to include that directly too. you know, thank you Lord for my parents who gave me life and the life that you gave me through them, etc. So, uh, certainly won't hurt. Um, there's no requirement that you have that in thanking God for something that you have to accurately name the entire causal chain involved that traces its being, you know, the, it, where at every step it is given its being by God and arranged so as to give you the goodness that God wants to give you. So, um, you, you don't need to name an entire secondary causal chain. Um, you know, we, every, every step along the way lives and moves and has its being in God to, to borrow the liturgical phrase, obviously not the things that that uh, don't live exactly, but you know, like rocks. Um, but they certainly, you know, they don't live and don't move, but they certainly have their being in God. So anyway, um, point being again, prayers of gratitude, pretty much the sky's the limit. Just, you know, be factually accurate and, uh, it, it's going to be valid. There's really no way to invalidly thank God for something that is good. So, uh, you're pretty much safe there. Um, the places I think where people really, um, or where the, where it's not quite so clear are intercessory prayer, 
prayers where you are asking God to intercede in the world in some way. Now, uh, this doesn't necessarily mean in a miraculous way, by the way. So, uh, if you are asking God, you know, um, you know, please, Lord, let the traffic lights be in my favor, you're not necessarily by any means asking God to miraculously change what the traffic lights will be so that you get someplace on time. You may well be asking God, you know, it's, it's beyond your knowledge of how to arrange these things and you are leaving it to the wisdom of God. So, um, as, as long as you do so, you know, like you could, I suppose, say, please God, miraculously, but not naturally ensure that the traffic lights are in my favor. But I've never heard of anybody who ruled out God organizing the world in such a way that it works out to the effect that they want, that they, they don't want that. They only want the miraculous version. So uh, I don't think you really need to worry about that one. Technically, logically possible, but of no practical consequence. You might very well be asking God to have arranged all of the things you know, um, all of the details of life, including like when traffic lights start and stop, the amount of time they take, the degree to which their timers are ever so slightly inaccurate, sometimes more than ever so slightly. Um, the, the amount of traffic that piles up, tricking traffic centers that feed into these things exactly when you are leaving and so on. It is way beyond your ability to organize any of this stuff, but it is by no means beyond God's ability to organize all of this stuff. And so your prayer that it all be organized in such a way that that the lights are in your favor and you get to a place on time because you do not at the moment have enough time budgeted in to arrive there on time. This is, you know, you're asking God to have arranged the world in such a way, you know, starting from the beginning of time like this. And since God is outside of time, that's fine. Um, that, you know, that, that works. That's a, a valid thing to request. And so, um, you know, th that is perfectly valid. Now, there's the question about, like, is intercessory prayer valid at all? Um, and I really liked uh, in, I think it's in God in the Dock, C.S. Lewis has a very brief conversation with somebody um, when some somebody's probably, you know, made up conversation to illustrate the point. But anyway, it's a conversation where somebody's saying that, like, intercessory prayer doesn't, you know, doesn't make any sense because, like, you know, God knows whether, you know, a thing should happen or not. And so, like, you have nothing to contribute on the subject. And, um, and to which Lewis replied, you know, th that certainly makes sense. I trust that you never take an umbrella with you because God knows whether you should be wet or dry. And uh, so, you know, you shouldn't offer God your opinion on the subject. You should just, uh, you know, take whatever comes. And he said, well, no, that's different, you know, be because that's natural. And you was very rightly pointed out. Well, there isn't a difference as far as your argument goes. You're, you're not in any way offering God advice on how to run the world in the one case, but not the other. When you put an umbrella over your head, you are very much implicitly making the suggestion that you remain dry today. So the idea um, that it, it is very strange, as he says, that we're given to do anything whatsoever. But as long as we are it has been, and it clearly has been given to us to make any kind of choice whatsoever. It is clear that God wants our input, that God has made the space for us to give our input into how creation is organized. And since God has done that clearly by, you know, allowing for the existence of things like umbrellas and allowing us to choose to use things like umbrellas or, you know, to wear clothes rather than to be whatever temperature the air outside is, well, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to ask for favors too. Now, uh, there's an interesting thing um, in, his, in his excellent video um, on prayer. Bishop Barron mentioned um, uh, somebody's idea that, that whenever we are um, asking for something in intercessory prayer, that is the Holy Spirit moving us to ask for what God wants to give us. So as to, to make this gift more perfectly complete, that we ask for what God wa already wants to give us. Um, and that, I think, you know, does also point towards the validity, uh, you know, how to identify valid intercessory prayer. And as I said in the beginning, basically it's going to come down to, is it an act of love? Um, but is the thing that you're asking for something that God wants to give you? And um, I don't mean that, like, you know for certain, but rather, is it plausible that this is something that God wants to give you? So, like, oh Lord, please you know, make my date want to fornicate with me at the end of our date. No, not valid. God does not want to give you that, clearly. That is not a thing that God, 
Um, it's not a thing that makes any sense. It's not a good. It is, in fact, an evil. And so to ask God for evils does not make any sense. Uh, moral evils, of course. Natural evils are different. Um, the, the moral natural evil distinction. So, so like a, a moral good is something like food. I'm sorry, a natural good is something like food. And a moral good is something like feeding the hungry. A moral evil is something like overfeeding a full man. Um, it, that's a relatively minor evil. Um, a natural good you know, might be something like nuts, which are nutritious, and a, nat and a moral evil would be feeding those nuts to a person who's allergic to them. Um, so natural goods are things that simply have being, and moral goods are things where you are using this being to some end. So um, moral goods are things where will intercedes, and natural goods are things pr before will affects them. So to be strong, to be rich, to be beautiful, these are all natural goods, and how you use them constitutes the moral goods. And uh, so, kind of similarly, so like, uh, no, natural evils are not, um, uh, evil basically in the sense meaning a deprivation. So, for example, uh, it is a natural evil for a thing to break down, but it might very well be a good idea to tear down a house that is unsafe to live in so that you can build up a good one. So this natural evil of destruction is not a moral evil because the thing that you are actually doing, the exercise of will, is directed towards the good. And so um, natural things, because we live in a world that changes, good things must pass away for other good things to come when you're talking about natural goods. When you're talking about moral goods, it's a different matter. You can't do evil so that good may result. You can't do moral evil so that good may result. You can do natural evil so that good may result. You can eat less food to go on a diet to lose fat. You can... Um, you know, hurt, uh, induce the pain of exercise where your muscles sustain damage in the, um, the, the lifting of heavy things such that they repair themselves and become stronger. So you can do natural evil that good may result. In fact, the only way to accomplish good is um, by way of also doing natural evils because it is impossible to do anything without making what had been before no longer be. So whatever good there was in the previous thing, you know, in, in dust settled down in a mildly pretty way, you have to destroy in order to reveal the beauty of the furniture underneath. Um, but that's a very, very different thing from doing moral evils, because moral evils and moral goods don't aren't at, at the level of, of simple physical change. So anyhow, um, so in terms of the validity of that, you can't ask for moral evils you can only ask for moral goods. But amongst that, um, pretty much anything, whether it's it's natural natural goods or natural evils, are so long as they are directed towards a moral good, and you know, you, you both the proximal and the dis the, the distant goods are, you know, and everything in between are all morally good. Approximate meaning close. Um, funnily enough, the word approximate means not close. Um, so an approximation is something that is not really close to the, the, the actual quantity is where the word approximate, but we tend to use the word approximate to mean close to the actual quantity. So it's, it's kind of a um, funny little etymological uh, thing. So, But the word proximate means very close to. And so the immediate thing you're doing has to be morally good, or at least morally neutral. Um, and, you know, every step along the way, morally good. And then pretty much you're, you're, you're golden there. So, um, you know, so if you, you, you can ask for, you know, all manner of things, good or bad, so long as the purpose of them is to be moral. And the whole reason why this is done in prayer is because, one of the many reasons, uh, sorry, <laughs> saying the whole reason is, is a way overstating what I mean. One of the reasons that this is done in prayer is because we don't know whether or not this would actually be good overall. When you ask to, you know, to have things arranged such that you can make a meeting on time, well, this affects an awful lot of other people, and you have no idea in what way this will affect those other people. And if you knew it absolutely all, the entirety of it, you could make a, a informed decision as to whether it would be morally good, be, neutral, or, or evil in order to arrange things in this fashion. But you can't know these things, so you're leaving it to the person who does know these things to actually make the choice. That's why all, you know, all... Um, all intercessory prayer, sort of implicitly, if you're not a fool, has that, you know, but not my will, but yours be done. As in, you don't want God to replace his judgment with yours. That's, that's not the point. The whole point of it being a prayer rather than an action is 
because you want God to use his judgment and not grant the prayer in the way you're asking if it would be bad to do so. So like, you know, if I pick my phone up, I'm not, you know, I know enough about this to be reasonably confident that this is a morally neutral action and there's nothing wrong with having done that, which is why I am not leaving it up to God to decide whether or not the phone should be up or down, but using the causal power that he gave me in order to accomplish this thing, because this is within the scope of my very limited knowledge. I, I know enough things about how phones work in air and space and the things around me and the stuff that I interact with to know that that is a morally neutral action. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, you know, leave it up to God whether or not my plate of bacon and eggs should be eaten in the morning or I should go hungry, because I know enough about these things to know that this is a morally good action. And, you know, it, it's a, you know, a little bit further about, you know, how I acquired them and so on. But, like, I know all of that stuff. I know all of the relevant facts about whether or not this is a morally good action to eat my breakfast. And so I eat my breakfast. Prayer, by contrast, is all about things where we don't know whether or not it's it's good or not and so we leave it up to god whether or not it should in fact happen because as far as we can see it would be good but we can't see very far and we know that that what we're asking for is beyond the limits of our vision you know please lord let me get this job well i don't know whether this job will actually be good for me or not i don't know whether or not that job would be better for somebody else you know for the company for them for me for all of humanity how the heck do i know it's so far beyond my knowledge so i pray to get it you know i i take the actions consonant with trying to get it i pray for it but i leave it up to god because whether or not i should succeed i don't know there are all sorts of things that people try to do where they really really wish afterwards they find out that they really wish that they didn't succeed there are a lot of things where uh, there are plenty of things where people try and then afterwards having a better perspective on it say like i am so glad i did not manage to do that um you know, the, the classic, like, um, you know, person who was like, you know, trying to marry somebody and, and eventually broke up and they, they're heartbroken over. It. And then later they discovered that like this person is actually like really, really awful to be with. Um, and, and, uh, you know, like, like after they, they tried to, you know, a, a woman, you know, you later find out a year later that she tried to like burn down the house with her boyfriend in it. Cause she was, you know, some fight and you're like, wow, I really dodged a bullet there. Yeah, that, that's a person being very, very devotely thankful that they did not accomplish their goal because they didn't know what it really in, in, you know, encompassed, what was really the consequences of that action. So this is um, why, you know, this is one of the great features of prayer is that we don't know whether or not we should succeed or fail on so very many things. And so in intercessory prayer, you necessarily are leaving it up to God. And so just sort of an aspect of it is just, be conscious of that fact that like part of why you leave it up to God and part of why things are structured this way is because you don't know whether or not you should succeed. And there's a good chance you shouldn't, you know, from your incredibly limited finite vantage point where you can't see what's going to happen half, you know, you don't even know half the people you'd interact with, whether they're, you know, saints or, or, or um, you know, tremendous sinners or, or somewhere in between. Um, you know, you, you can hope, you can say, like, as far as I can see, this looks good. So, you know, please, Lord, give it to me. But remember that implicit, unless I shouldn't have it, unless it would be bad for me, unless this is not a good idea, unless this would harm other people more than it benefits me. Um, so that's kind of the thing about intercessory prayer. It has this built in that that these are things they are out, that are outside of our ability to control. They're outside of our knowledge. Because the things that, you know, within our ability to control are generally speaking the things within our knowledge. So we don't really have the requisite knowledge to know whether or not they're good or bad. And so it is left up to the judgment of God because God sees all these things and knows whether it's good or bad. And, you know, and, and by the way, um, I do not mean that in like a super simplistic, like, uh, you know, like you're going to, you know, God really wants to give everybody a million dollars. And so like when you don't get something or other, it's just to you know save you so you can get the million dollars. Like bear in mind that among the gifts of God are being brutally murdered as a witness to the faith. So, you know, like, you know, St. Christopher, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, St. Christopher, you, you know, I, he wasn't martyred so far as I can recall. I was actually thinking of St. Sebastian, um, who, you know, was, was shot full of arrows you know, he's a Christian, um, he, he was in the emperor's, uh, I think he was in the Praetorian Guard, if I'm recalling correctly, or at least some very important prestigious military, 
uh, or part of the Roman military, and he um, um, and, and he became a Christian. And so they tied him to a tree and shot him full of arrows, but they didn't actually kill him. And an old woman took him and nursed him back to health. And then he went back to the emperor and started like shouting, um, you know, shouting at him. And so they took him and clubbed him to death, and that finally killed him. So bear in mind, among the gifts of God are being brutally murdered as a witness to the faith. So uh, I'm not trying to paint any kind of rosy picture of, uh, you know, if you don't get something, it's because God's going to give you even um, more bubbly, cheerful, happy, frou-frou uh, enjoyment. No, just God's going to give you good in some measure. I mean, you know, your life may not be very long. God may not have in store for you or me, uh, by the way, generic you here, um, you know, more than three minutes past the present moment. God may not have, you know, God may not intend to give to you more than two seconds past the present moment. Um, you do not know. And however much you have given is good. And then, you know, we're finite creatures. So once we're filled up, our time is over. And then, you know, we'll eventually enter into eternity with the, the full measure of goodness that God gave to us. So, you know, we have nothing to complain of because we're a heck of a lot better off than nothing. Um, but uh, the, 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 the point here is not some sort of, um, you know, bubbly, cheerful, like everything is going to just be comfortable and pleasurable and fun. Maybe things will be comfortable and pleasurable and fun for you, although history tends to suggest not uniformly. But um, the, the, the important thing is to recognize that they will be good and that God will grant your prayers in the measure that this is the goodness that he wants to give to you. And in his wisdom the goodness to give to you, including the wisdom to give to others. Because of course, like, if, you know, if you really understood that, like, if I do this, then like, you know, millions will be worse off. You wouldn't want whatever, you know, you wouldn't want to get to the, you know, some meeting on time, you know, f for, um, you know, at the expense of all sorts of terrible things happening that you have absolutely no earthly way of knowing, but God doesn't need to know them in earthly ways. He knows them in godly ways. And so God does know. And so, you know, implicit in all of your prayers of petition should, you know, should be, and I don't think it's necessary to say out loud for the most part, but as long as this actually would be better, as long as this actually would be good. You know, every now and again, throw in a reminder to yourself because it's easy to forget. But I don't think it needs to be a part of everything, but it should always be an implicit part of everything that like you don't, you know, it's like that, that uh, monkey paw thing, right? The, the one like, uh, you know, like you get a wish, but somebody will die. But uh, don't worry, it's nobody that you know um, that like you, you shouldn't actually want that. Uh, so if, if you would, that would be invalid invalid prayer. If, if, if you want something and you're willing to make the world vastly worse for the sake of you getting it, yeah, that would be invalid prayer. That would also very much be prayer not out of love. So, um, yeah. So as long as, like, you can have that implicit and if you need to, to be explicit, explicit. So long as this is actually good, I, I don't really know what it actually entails. Um, I think I have a video. I either have a video or going to make a video about how um, consequentialism is not even evaluatable. Like we don't know the consequences of actions well enough in order to, to know what they are. So consequentialism fails as moral philosophy because we can't evaluate anything. However, that does not apply to God. God has ne the necessary knowledge standing outside of time and being omniscient and, you know, everything having its being in him, has the necessary knowledge in order for consequentialism to actually work. This is, so I may have mentioned in the video, why consequentialism is attractive because it kind of it's a sort of description of how morality works from God's perspective, but it is not at all a description of how morality works from our perspective. So in an age where people kind of are a little pro in the age of modern philosophy, capital M modern, to mistake themselves for God, it kind of makes sense why it would be popular. Anyway, uh, the point here is that by making your prayer have that caveat, you are taking advantage of the fact that consequentialism does, in a sense, uh, work for God. So you can say like, but, but like, you know, use all that knowledge that you have about how this should go. I would like this and I'm hoping for it. So I would love it if you give this to me, assuming this to be good. So assuming that all the things I don't know actually work out such that this is good, then I would like this. And so I become part of that secondary causation of you giving it to me just as when I bring the food up to my mouth and eat breakfast in the morning. Um, but if it's not good, unlike what I know about breakfast in the morning, 
then please don't give it to me. So as long as you kind of have that framework, intercessory prayer will also be valid. Um, so again, just to wrap up, in all things, make sure it's out of love in the sense of agape, the, the love, the generous love of God, giving, you know, willing the good of the other for the sake of the other. And um, yeah, that, that's valid prayer. Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at. If you like this video, then clicking the like button, according to YouTube, will make them more likely to recommend it to others. If you know anyone who might get something out of this video, then it would be kind to share it with them, or just share it on social media in general. And if you'd like to see future videos of mine, you can subscribe. And uh, if you're not in the habit of checking your subscriptions page regularly, then I suggest clicking the notification bell and setting that to always, because otherwise uh, subscribing to a channel basically just sort of like gives YouTube a hint that maybe it should consider recommending these videos to you, possibly at some point if they think so. It's a funny world we live in. God bless.